Oh, hello, thank you for having me. Um, so I realize not everybody in here is an algebraic geometer, so I wanted to start this presentation with probably about half of it will be about, well, how do algebraic geometers think about moduli? How does that lead to the notion of stacks? And the second part of my presentation will be about these Artin theorems. And Artin theorems are a set of conditions that will tell you if a stack is algebraic, but we should know what that means before we start. So, okay. So this slide here just contains some examples of moduli problems that we consider in algebraic geometry. Very famous one is the moduli space of curves. But what I'm trying to say in this slide is that regardless where you're coming from in math, I think a moduli problem always starts kind of the same. You have some set of objects and you have some equivalence relation that you would like to place on the objects. And you want to understand the geometry of that set to some extent. And these are some problems that we care about. So we have the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. Now we put the relation of isomorphism. Another good example, a really good one to start with is conics in the plane. You have some options here about what you consider two conics to be related. I mean, they can be related by translation, equivalent. Yes. Oh, am I in the way? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or we can just consider them abstractly isomorphic as curves. And depending on the equivalence relation you choose, you're going to get a different space. Okay. Here's some more examples. We can consider vector bundles on a fixed curve. Now we actually have more options than what we want our moduli space to be. We can think of rank R degree D vector bundles up to isomorphism. We can fix a vector bundle and consider the flat connections on it or we can look at the representations. Another example is degree D line bundles on a curve. So those are some examples of moduli problems. Okay, so if you're just given the set of equivalence classes of some objects, the most naive thing you might wanna do is, okay, I have a set, let me try to put a topology on it. Then let me try to add more and more structure and see what I can build. Now, that's a, actually a really good idea and you can probably get a lot of information doing that, but the problem is, or the problem for me is, is that this is not going to be, catch any sort of no potence. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if you're going to use this first option, you're not going to be able to distinguish between the line and the double line. Okay, and the double line, as you see, is defined by the spectrum of this algebra and two variables, x squared, and you have a no potent there, x. Okay. So this was actually a huge problem in geometry and Broughton Dieck was very angry about it. He didn't think we could get a good you know, theory of algebraic geometry if we ignore no potence. Can't do that. So in order to think about no potence, well, we should first give a name to spaces which have no potence. Okay, so to distinguish them from spaces that don't. So let's call those schemes. That's sort of the idea of schemes. And okay, now that we have a name, well, how do we think about this space? So anybody who's worked with super manifolds has sort of encountered this problem. I have these no potent coordinates. I don't really understand how to think about this space. So in comes this idea of the functor of points, which Rita nicely talked about already yesterday. So what is the functor of points? Well, instead of understanding a space as its sort of set of points, why don't we look at maps into the space? Okay. So we define this functor that takes in a scheme and now it sets it spits out like all the maps from that scheme into the space. All right. Okay, so let's look at some examples of how to use this. So let's look at an example of x squared plus y squared. Now, if I evaluate the functor of points of that scheme on the spectrum of the real numbers, I'll get zero. So why is that? Well, if you remember x squared plus y squared is equal to x plus iy times x minus iy. There are no real solutions. So you're just, I should have actually written an empty set there, sorry. Well, zero sign. Okay, so there's no real solutions, but on the other hand, we have a lot of complex solutions to this. So notice that we get kind of very different spaces depending on the points that we look at. Did I forget it? I might have forgotten zero, zero. But the point is just that this has no real solutions other than zero. <laughs> I think I did write zero, but okay, it looks a little bit weird. What I mean, okay, you only have zero solution, but in the complex case, you have lots of solutions. Yeah, I should have done that, sorry. <laughs> okay, so more generally, so what do we call the functor points evaluated on some scheme? Those are the two T points of the scheme. Okay. All right, so we can describe a scheme by its functor. Now let's push that idea a little bit further. So how about instead of considering spaces, why don't we just look at functors themselves and then ask, 
when is this functor representing a space, okay? So here's the some big result called Yoneda's lemma that tells you or gives the definition of a representable functor means when it's naturally isomorphic to the functor of points of a scheme. Okay, so again, we're going to, instead of looking at spaces themselves, we're going to look at functors and then ask, when is this functor space? When is it naturally isomorphic to the functor of points of a scheme? Okay, I see some, you know, looks like, why would you do that? Like have algebraic geometers just lost it? I mean, why go away from spaces and just look at functors? So I want to convince you that it's actually a really powerful tool when it comes to moduli theory. So instead of looking at moduli spaces as just sort of these set of points where we can't see any no potents, we're going to reformulate the problem in terms of functors. So for example, my moduli space of curves, I'm now going to define as a functor that takes in a scheme and it spits out the following set, the isomorphism classes of families of genus G curves over T, okay? Now, same thing, I like the Picard functor as an example. We can do the same thing. I define it as a functor that takes in a scheme and now it just spits out isomorphism classes of degree D line bundles on this trivial family of curves C over T, okay? Okay, so now that we've actually defined our moduli problems in terms of functors, we wanna ask when is this functor representable? When does there exist a scheme whose functor of points is naturally isomorphic to this functor I defined? Okay, so I did the example for the moduli space of curves. And if there does exist such a scheme, then we say that that scheme is the fine moduli space of curves. Okay. All right, turns out, okay, it's not that great because most moduli functors you're gonna define are not representable. Okay, and let's look at an example of why that happens and why this problem actually naturally leads to the idea of a stuck. So what does it help again to have this H thing? Well, it means that you have the geometry of whatever your space is already built into the functor itself. Right, you're not just dealing with a set of points. This is looking at all possible ways that it can deform, all possible families of it. So what it helps when you have this natural isomorphism is that all you need to do is show that there exists a scheme. And then you- X helps afterwards? Well, X is a scheme. So you know that the moduli space is a scheme, right? You have given a name to what was beforehand just some arbitrary set of points. It's like asking, well, what does it help if something's a manifold? Well, I mean, that's good, right? Now you have this name, you know how to work with it. You have theorems to work with it. You can start, asking more questions about the space, like what are its line bundles? But you need this word to start. Yeah. Okay. okay, we wanna give a name to this sort of what is right now just an abstract set. Okay, so we say it's representable, or rather we say that a space is a fine moduli space of curves if it represents this functor. Now we can say that moduli space is a scheme or maybe even better, a variety or a manifold. But we need to start at some point, right? Okay. So again, things are not that good. Moduli functors are usually not going to be representable. So my favorite example of this, and I think really leads us naturally to stacks, is if you look at genus zero curves. Okay, so here's my moduli space functor. I'm again going to take in a scheme and I'm going to spit out all isomorphism classes of families of genus zero curves over that scheme, okay? Now, there's only one genus zero curve over point up to isomorphism, and that's the projective line. Okay, so what that means that if I evaluate my moduli functor on the spectrum of the complex number, so over point, I'm just going to come up with one point. Okay, that set contains exactly one point representing just the projective line. It's correct, but let's see why the moduli functor cannot be representable because of it. So one way to say that a scheme represents the functor is to say that we have this sort of universal curve over that scheme. What is a universal curve in this case? Well, it's some sort of family of curves over my space X, such that for every other family of curves, there exists a unique map from T to X, such that that family of curves is the pullback of the universal curve. So another way of saying a functor is representable. Now, if I have this problem that over a point, the only 
you know, curve I have is the projective line, then any pullback of it is just going to be a trivial family, right? It'll just be a projective line times whatever the base was. Okay. Pro now, why does that imply that our moduli space functor is not representable? Well, there's tons of non-trivial families. So here's a whole class of them. So if I take, <laughs> it's a little bit confusing. I'm taking my base to be the projective line. And now remember that my moduli functor is going to take in the projective line and spit out all isomorphism classes of genus zero curves over the projective line. We just saw in the previous example that the universal curve is just always going to pull back to the trivial family. But here are a lot of non-trivial families. So we have these here to close surfaces as an example, right? So for each integer n, I can give you a non-trivial family over the projective line. Okay. Yes, you have a question? Oh, sorry. Okay. So the implication is our moduli functor is not representable. All right, so how do we deal with this? Okay, so let's take some inspiration from vector bundles. Now, like vector bundles, locally a family of genus zero curves is trivial. I, it's the product of the projective line times the base. This should maybe remind you a little bit about vector bundles. Locally, every vector bundle is trivial, and we create non-trivial vector bundles by gluing with an element of GLN along the intersection. Okay. Same with line bundles, right? That's how we classify line bundles. Now, in this case, it's very similar. We have this sort of trivial family, and now we're going to create non-trivial families by gluing with elements of the automorphism group of P1. So for each element of PGL2, I can glue these two non-trivial families together and give you, sorry, trivial families together and give you a non-trivial family. So again, completely analogous to line bundles or vector bundles. Of course, I'm not being completely rigorous, but that's really the idea. So why am I talking about this example? Well, you might have heard the slogan before that, well, functor is not representable because your moduli objects might have automorphism, non-trivial automorphisms. Okay, so what does that actually mean? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have so much meaning on its own, but what that slogan is really referring to is this, this sort of fact that you can create these non-trivial families if you have non-trivial automorphisms. Okay. All right, so let's go back to vector bundles and think about what we can do with vector bundles. So vector bundles are actually classified by H1 of the general linear group. Okay. Other words, H1 is also the isomorphism classes of torsors, of GLN torsors, right? So this problem that we're having is somewhat going to have to do with torsors, in particular PGL2 torsors, okay? And in fact, like think about the classification of line bundles, it's H1 of O star. All that's saying is that the isomorphism classes of line bundles, you know, it can be somehow related to C star torsors. Because you already know the base. Yeah. You're looking for the base. Of, yeah, I don't know the base yet. I'm just here. I'm talking about an arbitrary scheme, though. Like over T, it doesn't matter what it is. I can. I still know that locally this family is trivial. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, of course, that's very difficult. But this is just intuition. I'm going to tell you what the universal base is in a second. But this is the intuition. Over every scheme, locally trivial family, we create non-trivial families by gluing with an element of PGL2, gluing the fibers with an element of PGL2. Okay. And what I was trying to say here is that this is somewhat reminiscent of, you know, torsors, like G torsors. Okay, so we're going to reformulate our moduli problem in terms of PGL2 torsors. Okay, okay. so we have this nice fact about groupoids. Now this looks kind of strange, why am I talking about this? But it's good to keep in mind that your category whose objects are all G-torsers and whose morphisms are isomorphisms of G-torsers is actually equivalent to the category consisting of one point, whoops, whoops, anyway. right. is equivalent to your category, which has one point as its object and morphisms are all the elements of G. It's kind of crazy, right? There's objects, this first, kind of category, this groupoid has, you know, infinite elements and the other one has like one. So it was kind of surprising that those are 
isomorphic. But if you understand this example, you can essentially understand what the stack is. Okay, this latter groupoid with objects in a single point and morphisms G is called the classifying stack of G. It's usually denoted as this quotient point mod G. And it's just this groupoid. In other words, it also classifies, you know, G torsors, which is what we're after. Moreover, it's an example of an algebraic stack, essentially a quotient by a group that's not finite. <laughs> okay, so why are we talking about that is because now I'm going to reformulate my moduli functor for genus zero curves in terms of groupoids. Okay, why am I doing that? It's because, uh, again, it's because this latter category is easily described as a stack. Okay. Here's my reformulation. Now I'm going to take in a scheme and I'm going to spit out the following groupoid. Its objects are families of genus zero curves and its morphisms, okay, are isomorphisms of curves. So in particular, notice that I'm not considering the set of isomorphism classes. I've completely gotten rid of that. Uh, Valentine, I, I don't know what the question is. <laughs> You can probably mute all audience. Mute all. No, no, mute all. Mute all. Yeah. Okay. That did it. Okay. All right. Okay. Again, I reformulated my moduli functor now into a functor of groupoids. Right. Again, using this somehow intuitive idea that this is somewhat similar to when we glue vector bundles, except now we're gluing with PGL2 instead of GLN. Okay, it takes some work, but essentially at the end, you'll get that this is actually going to be the algebraic stack point mod PGL2. Again, you can sort of picture this as a category with one object and all morphisms, the elements of G. All right. But really, if you understand this example, we can easily understand what a stack is. All right, so let's move on to the more general. I just gave you an example of an algebraic stack. Well, what is a stack? So okay, I'm going to be bold and just say it's a you know, sheaf of groupoids in the Atal topology. Whatever that means, you can ignore it. What you should really think about it is functor, which takes in a scheme and spits out a groupoid. Right? Other than that, OK, it's very technical, but doesn't matter. What I'm really after are algebraic stacks or algebraic super stacks. Now, algebraic super stacks are stacks for which we can define a smooth cover. Okay. Now, this first condition is somewhat of a technical condition that tells you that you're, you know, mapped into the stack or representable by schemes, whatever. What's really important about algebraic stacks is that they have this smooth cover by an affine scheme or affine super scheme. Okay, so for example, let's look back on the point mod PGL2. Its smooth cover is just the point. Okay. And then this first condition translates into showing that the isomorphisms of your objects, that's, that's a sheaf that's representable by schemes. Okay, let's not worry so much about that condition. It's very easy to show in general. Okay, any questions? Okay, so again, algebraic stack has a smooth cover. Okay, so now we're back at Artin's algebraization theorems. So Artin's original theorems were just a list of easily verifiable conditions that will tell you if your stack is an algebraic stack. Okay. So if, what those conditions really are about is showing that you have the smooth cover. So there's about eight conditions, and if you can check off all of those, then you know that your stack has a smooth cover, thus is an algebraic stack. Okay. Now, his algebraization theorems are actually sort of three theorems. The first one is called Artin approximation. The second one is called Artin algebraization. And the third one is called algebraization for stacks. And it's in this sort of third paper of his where you'll see these conditions. And in that same paper, he actually defined an algebraic stack. So somehow he was thinking about them at the same time. Okay. So what I've highlighted here in red 
are sort of like the very difficult parts of proving these theorems. So I'm not going to go into detail just because I don't have time and somehow various technical is this neuron Popescu to singularization is a big theorem in commutative algebra. And sort of the second hardest part about the proving these theorems is this openness of versality condition. And we'll talk about what that means. So my recent result is that I proved all of these theorems, but in the super case, the theorems look the same. So it's really about how you actually prove them or the strategy I took to avoid these really hard parts using the fact that we already know it on the reduced space. I'll present that theorem at the very end, but let's talk a little bit about what these three theorems actually say. Okay, so let's start with this. Do not read that. I'm just putting it up there in case you're interested. It's not gonna make sense unless you're somehow really into commutative algebra. But let's talk about how these three theorems are going to give us a cover. So I'm gonna use sort of the universal <laughs> image for space is just like this blob. Okay, this blob is a stack. Very, very weird space, but whatever. We're just gonna call it a stack. Now, for every point in the stack, I'm going to give like a small, every point I'm going to give somehow like a power series approximation of the stack at that point. Okay, it's exactly similar to approximating you know, something in calculus by a tangent line. You know, you take your parabola, you draw a little line, that's your first order approximation. Your second approx order approximation looks a little bit more like the function itself and so on. I'm going to do the same thing in some precise way for a stack. At each point, I'm going to make some sort of power series approximation. Okay. What? Yeah, it's a formal neighborhood of the point, but if you don't know those words, just think of it as a power series approximation. You can call it a formal neighborhood. That's true. That's exactly what it is. Now, what is this saying? So I hand to, I don't know, Artin every power series approximation at each point. And now Artin gives me back the following response. If you give me an integer, I will give you a cover that agrees with this power series approximation up to nth order. Okay. But be careful, because if you give me another integer, say n plus one, I will give you a cover, but it may not agree with this original cover. Okay, i.e. this cover I give you, which agrees with the power series approximation up to n plus one order, is not going to agree necessarily with the nth one. Yep, he's gonna give me a cover around each point for each integer that agrees with that power series approximation in some sort of precise way. But if I give him a different integer, he's going to give me back a different cover or more, he's not gonna guarantee that he'll give me the same cover. So this cover he gives you depends on the integer. And then you say, well, you know, thank you, Artin. <laughs> That's really nice, but I would like a cover that works for all n. Okay, I don't want, you know, to give me different covers for each end. That's not somehow very useful for me. Moreover, with that cover, I can't prove this thing is an algebraic stack. Okay, so then you ask him, well, I mean, what can I do so that you give me a cover that actually works for all n? And he says, well, you need to guarantee me that these power series representations you started with have this proper, like pr this property called form versality. Now, formal versality is just a very fancy way of saying that you have lifts. So essentially, when he gave me this nth order cover, this formal versality is going to guarantee that any other cover restricts to it. Okay, so we have liftings of this power series approximation. Yes. Uh, formal versality is only for local Artin, and formal smoothness is for all like Noetherian algebras. Mm -hmm. So it's really a very, very local, like infinitesimal condition. He's not being like that nice, right? He's not gonna give me a smooth cover right away. He's just gonna tell me how to approximate one. Okay, so again, thank you. That's nice, but how am I ever going to prove this object, this power series I give you is formally versal? I mean, that's a hard problem in itself, okay? I mean, formal versality again, just means that the covers agree. It's just a word for that. All right, so then he says, okay, well, this is the theorem where he says, if you give me this formally versal object every point, I'll give you 
a cover that agrees for Hn. This is somehow the formal way of saying that. And you can ignore it unless you really like this sort of. Okay. So again, tells me, give me a formal universal object. And I think, well, how am I going to find that? So then you have to go see somebody named Schlesinger. <laughs> okay. So what Schlesinger tells you is, well, if you check off these three conditions, whatever they mean, some lifting condition, then I guarantee you that that object is formally versatile. That object, this original power series approximation is formally versatile. I will guarantee you that if you are able to check these three conditions off. Those three conditions in practice are easy to verify. Where's C? Where's, where's C? Oh, C is the category of like local art and super algebras. Again, we're working extremely locally, very infinitesimally. So you have to specify that category. Of course, there's all sorts of formality and eh, going on, but Schlesinger tells you, yes, I will tell you if this object is formally versatile, but I'm not going to tell you if that object converges. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's like giving a power series, but you have no idea what its radius of convergence is. So it might not be helpful. Right? So again, Schlesinger does something nice, but on the other hand, it doesn't fully help you because, well, you've given me a power series without a radius of convergence. Sort of, yes. Oh, <laughs> That's all I'm trying to say. It's like, it's, it's great. But on the other hand, like you still have a lot of work to do because this, when he tells you it's formally versatile and then you can use Artens to say, okay, I have this cover, that cover may not converge. And the, and that somehow, that has to do with the fact that in algebraic geometry, we don't work with functions like the exponential. We only use polynomials. Okay, so somehow this function, this cover that Art and Schlesinger give you is more like a power, like an exponential function and not a polynomial. And if that's the case, we can't use it. All right, so again, this is useful, but how do we deal with the fact that we don't know if this sort of object is algebraic, doesn't really necessarily converge? Well, you can't really deal with that in a good way. Instead, you define this property a functor can have. Now, this Prop, this property called effectivity, you know, again, a fancy word for just saying that if I have this sort of formal object, it will convert. <laughs> it's a property of the functor. Every formal object I give you, every sort of like sequence is actually going to converge to an algebraic object. If I give you a power series, this functor, this effectivity property guarantees that power series is a polynomial. I were excluding like exponential functions when we do this. In this case, yeah, it's Artinian. Oh, it doesn't have to be actually. Though. Um, so when you go on to use Schlesinger's theorem, you have to use a deformation functor. And a deformation functor is a set valued functor. So you take your group weight valued functor and now consider instead it's isomorphism classes. Now that's a set valued functor and it's something you can use deformation theory on. So Nadia, mm -hmm. I have a question. So yeah. The effectiveness in the super world, can you just go down and have and uh, reduce it to, to the actual, I actually, right? I actually don't know about this property because effectivity is kind of a property that's like part of Artin's conditions. I see. Yeah, so I didn't prove anything about that. I was wondering yeah. because it seems that you can. It's, right? it's actually like those problems always seem very easy, but if you start writing it out, no, it no, becomes very I'm hard. I'm asking, I'm not telling Oh, I see. No, no, I just want to give a warning you, if you're doing this. something obvious at all. I'm just asking. Oh, no. no, unfortunately, I just put this as part of Artin's condition. That's what Artin also okay. did. So I just followed his, his idea. Okay. Again, I'm going to just assume my functor is effective. I don't want to worry about convergence. So I want Schlesinger telling me that an object is formally versatile to be useful. Okay, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is, is this like adding a uh, descent for another Brooklyn topology then? Well, sorry, say that again? Is this adding descent for another Brooklyn topology? No, no, it's just a really basic property that your functor can use with direct limits, essentially. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, so it's just okay, so mm -hmm. Yeah. I think every functor preserves, you know, the direct limit, but not the inverse limit. So this is just saying your functor commutes with the inverse limit, essentially. But that doesn't make sense, really, if you don't know those words. So maybe just think about it as convergence. Okay. It's a property we give to the functor. It's going to become part of Artin's condition. All right. Okay. So, so far, what do we have? If I assume my functor is effective and I give Artin these formally versatile power series expansions at each point of my stack, 
he gives me a sort of, he gives me a cover, but this cover is very infinitesimal in nature and it's not smooth necessarily. Okay. So in order to make these, this, this cover that Artin gave me into something that I can show is actually a smooth cover of my stack, I need to show that somehow these are smooth in a neighborhood. Okay, so previously all of my lifting conditions were on art and rings or you know, vector spaces. It's very infinitesimal, but now I need to expand that to all rings. Okay, so I need the lifting property to hold not just for vector spaces, but for rings. That's what formally smooth means. And this is the last thing I need to show to show that this cover that Schlesinger and Artin gave me is actually a smooth cover. All right, this is very, actually the most difficult part is this fifth part. And the way you prove that is in two steps. Okay, so again, we need to give some sort of useful criterion to show that this cover is actually smooth. All right, it's not just an infinitesimal approximation, it's actually, you know, a cover. Like, so the first thing that we're gonna show is that formal versality is an open condition. So that means that you can use the same cover for some sort of small neighborhood around each point. Remember at the beginning, I gave a power series approximation at each point. So this cover is not somehow seeing the cover at the other points. Now formal versality is going to tell you that, well, that cover you got, gave me at that point is actually a cover for all the points near it. Okay. Again, that looks more like a cover you're used to from like topology, right? It's not like you give me a cover for each point, you give me a neighborhood around each point. And that's what formal versality is about. Okay. And then afterwards, after we establish this open condition or moral, like after we establish conditions for formal versality, we need to show that formal versality and formal smoothness are actually equivalent notions, which is, which is not at all obvious. Okay. Because again, formal versality was a property a functor has when you evaluate it just on art and rings on vector spaces, but formal smoothness is a property of a functor when you evaluate it on rings. That was a very big step between those two things. Okay. Now to prove the Artin theorems in the super case, I actually didn't use Artin's original proof. It's, I never understood it, it was very hard. And instead I used a condition for formal versality being open by somebody named Flenner. Okay, he describes this condition in terms of a certain sheaf whose vanishing locus is the points where this functor is, where my object is formally versal. So again, I have this sort of candidate for covers everywhere. And now I'm going to define a sheaf on each individual one of those covers. Not a sheaf of the rings, it's a sheaf of pointed sets. Okay. And now, so suppose that sheaf were coherent, then the fact that formal versality is open would follow immediately from the fact that the support is coherent. But I don't know that the sheaf is coherent, it's just a sheaf of pointed sets. Okay, but that's the way that I'm going to show that versality is open, is using a sheaf like this. It's an idea that was sort of after Arden. Okay. Now there's a list of extremely sort of weird looking conditions that ensure that this is a coherent module it's coherent support, thus the, thus the points at which my object is formally versal is open. Questions? Okay, if not, let's look at the last one, this formal smoothness. I'm not going to talk a lot about that as it's a very technical kind of result, but once we've established this openness of versality, it's actually not so hard to show that formal smoothness implies Sorry, it's not so hard to give conditions that show that formal smoothness implies formal versality. All right, sorry, formal versality implies formal smoothness. That's just that they're equivalent conditions. Okay, again, formal smoothness about lifting properties on rings and not just vector spaces. Okay, so this brings us to, well, what does Artin's theorems actually look like for super stacks? All right, so it's on two slides. I'll show you the conditions. So this first condition should just, you know, that's just the first condition to be a stack, uh, an algebraic stack, is that this diagonal map is representable. That actually becomes part of Artin's conditions. The reason we do that, it's pretty easy to show. 
Now, the second condition is again that we want these power series approximations to converge. That's the affective property. Now, the third one here is this coherence of the obstruction theory. This is again just about a condition that's going to imply that that sheaf, that that sheaf whose vanishing locus are the formally reversal points is coherent. Okay, so you need this condition to prove that that sheaf is coherent. Oh, again, okay. Okay, <laughs> now again, this is also this A4, this constructability condition is another condition that we need to show that this sheaf whose vanishing locus are the formally reversal points is coherent. We also need this condition, this constructability condition. Okay, the fifth condition now starts, um, it's one of the conditions that I need to show, need to use to show that formally versal implies formally smooth. The, the next three are all about that. Same with the sixth condition. Again, formally versal implies formally smooth. And I forgot to mention one. Okay, also we definitely need to assume Schlesinger's conditions hold, right? Otherwise we didn't even have that formally versal object to give to our. Right, so these are the eight conditions, if you can count S1 and S2 as two, that are going to require that your stack, your super stack as an algebraic super stack. So I just recently proved these, and the way I proved them is I kind of said it at the beginning, I used the fact that we know it on the bosonic reduction, and the fact that the nopotens kind of are, you know, like finite extensions to reduce a lot of the really, really hard commutative algebra that Artin had to use. So in particular, I was able to avoid, uh, let's go back, this neuron pesky to singularization theorem. That's not something you really want to <laughs> prove on your own. And this openness of versality theorem, I was able to reduce somehow the complications that arise there a little bit by using the fact that it holds on bosonic reduction. So I'm not gonna necessarily like show you how I reduced it because it's very technical and, not sure if everybody here knows a lot of commutative algebra. So if you want to know, I, I can show it to you. <laughs> but basically the idea is that if you replace some of Artin's very difficult theorems with Flenner's, I think easier to understand theorems, and you use the fact that Artin approx algebraization is known on the bosonic reduction, it's not so difficult to prove this in the super case. Okay. All right, so any questions about this? I think I'm out of time. <laughs> I can also show a very easy like example of what art and approximation is if you guys are interested, but. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. 